Thank you. Well, Michael's leading his way up here. Uh, what, what do you really want to know about cannabis while Michael's still coming up to the stage? What is, do you really want to know about cannabis? Why have you come here? Give me one big question. How do you know what's the percentage of the various medications, like what concentrations are in them? Do you want me to deal with that one? Yes. I can tell you just very briefly though, and then I'll put you onto the professionals. Okay. If you stuff a whole lot of cannabis into a pipe and you blow carbon dioxide through it and you knock off all those little medicinal trichromes and they go like a little goo into a syringe and you collect it up, or you dip it in alcohol and let the alcohol evaporate and you get that goo, right, the medicine, then you put it under the extract, you put it under a microscope, we send it off to laboratories, and they tell us that this goo as is 20% CBD, 10% THC, there's some CBDA, there's a little bit of CBN, so it's got all these chemicals in it. They're all plant extracts, so the whole plant works better than in isolation. But the pharmaceutical model is isolation is more profitable than the whole plant because we can copyright some fancy extraction technique. Okay? But remember the whole plant is better. And uh, what is good for you? Do I need to have the strongest dose? In short, I'm not going to hold you on Michael, but uh, is essentially everyone needs to start off at a low dose. Yes. So you drop the ball on the, on the floor and you just start off like a baby take a low dose and every day you keep increasing until you get relief for your symptoms be it pain, Alzheimer's, withdrawal symptoms, sadness, anxiety, cancer, whatever disease it is this plant is not a miracle plant but it is a homeostasis plant and it will realign the organs and functioning of your body to be an optimum level to the best that it can Okay, if you're living under a radiation plant, you know, you're going to have other variables that are going to affect your life. Anyway, I'm going to put you back to Michael because really, I'm really proud to be part of the Nimbin scene here. I've worked in the medical health field for 30 years and really, to be honest, these people stumbling in the dark, but really they are the beacons of hope in Australia. There's not many other people doing it, and to be a civil activist is a big thing. Yeah, I'm very proud. So, so it, you, you can't tell, can you? She's a highly qualified nurse. Isn't that great? And helps us enormously in the Hemp Embassy. And went out and did a gig till 3 a.m., and now she's here again. So, so, you know, cannabis turns you into an idiot, they've told you, you know. She's... <laughs> It's, it's interesting. Anyway, doc, I'm going to put Dr. Deb on. She's travelled a long way to be here this weekend. She is, is another, you know, the whole cannabis world is so underground and been so hidden for so long. People are coming out. She's not someone who's been hiding. But it, it's fantastic you guys have all come. And I, I just want to reiterate, the best thing you can do is probably get to your local politicians. And it's worth thinking about. You, they want to hear. Deb's one of them. You're talking to your local member, up in Warwick. <laughs> no, not Warwick. Gundawindi. 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 Dr. Deb, thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. You're going to explain the trivia quiz. Yes, yes, I'll do that first. We'll get to that. Now, um, you know, unfortunately, I always seem to get my uh, best in inspiration for ideas like 24 hours before I'm due to speak. And so, the... Uh, the concept of the trivia quiz has been evolving over the weekend, so I know there may be a couple who are devastated, but we won't do the rest of it today because we've actually got bigger plans for it now. Um, if everyone would like to write down my email address, so it's pretty easy, just Deb Wold, D-E-B-W-A-L-D, so it's like, you know, Debbie Waldron's my name, so it's like Deb Wold at bigpond.com. So anyone who has any ideas for questions they think that they feel are essential, you know, that get asked at some point, any ideas on a format, um, anything like that, I'm very open to suggestions.
But roughly the plan is to run it over the two days of the Medican weekend. The first day is audi the audience quiz. And at the end of that, we'll have a little semi-final so that anyone who gets two ticks or more gets to go into the semi-final to see who goes into the final the next day. And that will give general public you know, audience members a chance to get into the final because you know, the local experts do know a fair bit. So we thought that might even the playing field just a little bit. And, um, and then the final, I was thinking of running it something in the format of hard quiz, if anyone's ever watched that. Is that right? Did I spell it right? Sorry? Is that right? What's right? Turn around. Oh, um, except all lowercase. That doesn't matter. But yes, that's right. And um, yes, yeah, so we'll um, make it so that the final is a bit, you know, there's a specialty area, um, but there will be general rounds as well. Um, and that we'll have a little section, if any question is challenged, then it goes into a little pot and does not count to the total. And at the end, we'll have a 10 minute break for people to go out and get research to back up their challenge, be it you know, um, the question, the person who's asked the question or the person who's answered the question. Um, and that's just to give it a little bit more depth and to allow for debate and discussion because the one thing I want to, for people to get out of this trivia quiz is that we can't talk in absolutes with cannabis medicine or even, you know, the whole cannabis industry. There is no one best way. There is no only way. Um, it's like we're all learning together. This is, a, this is a completely new field of medicine. And in order for it to succeed, we have to actually go back to the individualised form of medicine that we used to do before Big Pharma brought it all out. Um, and we need to go back to natural medicine first. And I'm really hoping that the emergence of cannabis medicine is the gateway to our return to natural medicine and individualised medicine. So, um, yeah, cannabis is definitely a gateway drug because that's what's going to lead us back into the light. So that's my hope. That, that cannabis will be the catalyst for that sort of change. And that's why I'm doing a degree in herbal medicine, because um, I really feel that I can help people better by doing the natural things first. You know, so it's basically correcting the microorganisms in your gut, because that is also another new field of medicine that's emerging, which is also extremely exciting. And orthodox medicine is actually getting a bit on board with this one. So, um, you know, I think that anything that you see on SBS or anything about the gut microbiome, watch it. Because it's, um, it's really fascinating. So that's digressing a bit. But um, it just means that, you know, there's a few really simple things that we can do straight away to improve our health. And really it's considering food as medicine and herbs because it's all on a continuum and making sure we feed those little buggers in our guts the right things. Um, but there's other people who can, you know, talk a lot more about those areas. So um, now is there, um, I might just address that question about percentages again, if that's okay. Um, because it's a bit like, if, if it was in the trivia quiz, it would be one of my blocked bong questions. Because there really is no correct answer or, um, well, you know, in a nutshell, in Australia, we really have no way of knowing what percentages we have in our medicines. Because we're not allowed to test it. Because it's illegal. So hey, you know, in the government, in their wisdom, let's just do the less safe thing. And we'll just spread in the media how dangerous our green market medicines are, but don't let us test it. So, you know, this is what we're up against when we're trying to provide medicine for people. But we can use a few things as a rough guide. First of all, you're starting out with the plant. And that plant will have a certain percentage of cannabinoids 
in the flower, um, and a certain percentage of those cannabinoids will be THC and CBD. Now, because cannabis medicine is still in its infancy, we can't really talk a great deal about the other cannabinoids. We're still pretty much still stuck on THC and CBD, but that's okay because it's very safe to start anywhere. And then you tweak as you go. So the first thing we look at is what ratio of THC to CBD we want in our medicine. Um, and then we would look at what the other cannabinoids might be. I mean, if we're lucky enough to get it tested, we can, there's a bit of clandestine testing that we can get done, but, you know, and that can give us a few clues. But if we're not getting the improvement that we think when we've started a new medicine that appears to be the same as the old medicine, then perhaps the difference is in one of those other cannabinoids. Does that make sense? Okay, so we've got our bud. So what do we do with it? There's several different ways of extraction. The safest is into an oil. Cannabis is a resin. And when you're learning about in herbal medicine manufacturing, um, a resin is a substance because the herbal medicine tends to use alcohol as their solvent, you know, because it's just so, it's relatively safe um, and it's a very good solvent. It will, it will dissolve most things. Um, so, uh, resins, and to give you an example of another resin, the calendula flower, which looks like a big marigold flower, um, that delicate, fragile looking thing actually contains resin. And you have to ex extract it in the same way as you extract cannabis. Yeah, I know, I was pretty amazed by that, because you sort of think of resin as this, you know, thick, heavy, sticky substance. And how can it be in this beautiful, delicate flower? But that's nature for you. Anyway, so cannabis being a resin requires at least 90% alcohol for extraction. Now, this means you can't use vodka. Uh, you will get some extraction. It won't be completely hopeless, but it would be a waste, really, because you would be throwing out a lot of, you know, goodies along with it. There's not very many ways of getting 90% alcohol. You can, um, as a herbal medicine student, I'm not allowed to get it yet, but I have a still. So I make my own. And though it's technically illegal, um, if you're not selling it, then no one's going to bother you. I find it really interesting that one of my local councillors in Gundawindi actually has the home brew shop. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so he's selling all this equipment to make alcohol and technically it's illegal and he's a local councillor, so there you go. Um, so let's just say they turn a bit of a blind eye to it if you're not actually selling it. Um, and it by far is the cheapest way to go. Like you can actually produce a bottle of 90% alcohol for about $12 a litre. So, um, or people use, they can get online, um, if you can get it through, they can get Everclear, which is a grain alcohol, and that's about a 90%, and you can use that as well. So there are your options. So if you can't get that percentage alcohol, then you can't do an ethanol extraction. So you're stuck with oil. The problem with oil infusions um, are that you can really only get about a one in five strength. Is the simple physical properties, you need at least five times the amount of herb there to get it covered with enough oil so that it will extract. So you can do multiple infusions by taking your oil, your one in five oil, then adding another lot of herb and getting the strength up that way. Does that make sense that you would do that? But you're starting to get into quite a long time, you know, you're, looking, you're getting close to a month of trying to get a really decent infused oil because you need to really, at least a couple of weeks, shaking it every day to get a good extraction into an oil. So, but it is still the only method and you can get those magic butter machines now and they're apparently pretty good. And there are really fancy ways, like the rosin presses, where it's lovely and pure, all you're doing is pressing it out of the plant, which is great. You know, you've got your supercritical CO2, which as Michael pointed out, is the um, gold standard for CBD extraction, but they're not really available to the home grower. You know, they're pretty much commercial operations. So we're stuck with the uh, more primitive forms of extraction. 
Now, one way, so if you say start out with a plant that's got 10% THC, so in the flower, so you would expect that whatever you extract it into, 10% of that is going to be your THC. So if you're doing an oil infusion, then you would say you've got 100 grams of herb into 500 mils of oil, and you have 10% of that 100 grams is THC. Then that gives you a rough idea, and I am not even going to attempt to do any maths. I will leave it to you guys. I'll just give you sort of guidelines as to how you work it out. So that then gives you a way of figuring out roughly how much THC is in it. So as you can see, by the time you've done the maths, it's not very potent. So that's why we go on to other methods of extraction, like now with ethanol, which is alcohol, you, it also extracts the chlorophyll. That's why ethanol extracted medicines are green. Now, there's nothing wrong with chlorophyll. It's a really healthy thing, you know, you can get chlorophyll supplements. So there's nothing wrong with having a chlorophyll in there. But it takes up room so that if you think you've got 10%, well, you've also got, you know, your 10% might be just all your cannabinoids you know, of which most of that will be THC. But then you've got your terpenes, you've got your lipids and your waxes, you've got your flavonoids, you've got, um, what else is in there, chlorophyll. So you've got all these other constituents. So the, the only way you're really going to start to get a good idea of how much THC is in your medicine is by doing an extraction that gives you the purest result. So one way, for example, of cutting down how much chlorophyll is extracted as well is doing a thing we call a cold ethanol extraction. You freeze everything and you work quickly and you do it cold. And that way it does, it probably improves your cannabinoid yield by about 10% on just a warm ethanol extraction. So instead of, you know, these are just rough figures, say you may approach a 50% concentration of your cannabinoids, of which most of that will be THC, um, or, um, you know, so you sort of, and then with the cold ethanol you may get 60%. That's pretty bloody good, actually. Um, so, but that's sort of looking at the maximum that you could get. So then you start looking at the other solvents. Now, we're moving into solvents that may have adverse effects. So the most important thing when you move into using other solvents is that you have to purge them extremely well. Now, some solvents are worse than others, and the general rule is if that solvent has a benzene ring in its molecular structure, it has the capability of becoming a toxic byproduct. So that's the thing you need to look at. And so, now look, I'm sure I can be challenged on this, so I'm not going to say I'm remembering this correctly, you know, I haven't gone into it to this depth, but for example, things like ISO and naphtha and those things have all got benzene rings. There is one that doesn't, but still may have some adverse effects, and I consider it to be the compromise solvent, and that's butane. Now, I'll add a little caveat to that, because butane is actually fairly similar to alcohol in structure, if you actually have a look at the molecule. But I'll add a little caveat to that. Do not think you can just go in and get some gas mate butane off the shelf and use that for extraction. Smell it. It's got impurities in it that are dangerous. So one thing, do not use 
any other commercial form of butane apart from Venti brand. Venti is the only one that does not contain adulterants. It is not a um, medical grade butane, but it's the closest you'll get outside of paying $14, $15 a can for medical grade, which you can order online. I have a challenge. <laughs> yes? Yes? Yes. No, other way around. Other way around. Ethanol is far, far safer. Far safer. All alcohols are not equal. It is, it's the propyl part that's the problem in isopropyl alcohol. Um, so, look, herbalists have been using ethanol for extraction ever since they figured out how to ferment and get alcohol. Um, you have to be, do be careful with pregnancy, you be careful with people who are alcoholics, you be careful with people who have severe liver disease. But on the whole, the amount of alcohol that's in herbal tinctures is quite safe. And it, it is exactly the same with an alcohol extracted cannabis tincture or fluid extract. It's the same, you know. Like, um, you look at your risk benefit ratio, and this is where we come back to the butane. When you look at the risk benefit ratio of using butane as a solvent, it leaves all the chlorophyll behind. And this is where if you look online and you look at people look at, saying they're talking about dabs and waxes and shatter and glass and all of that stuff, it's basically butane or BHO, butane honey oil is another name because it, it, you get this lovely yellow brown colour. Um, and so you automatically, like common sense would tell you, you have a more potent, pure product because there's no chlorophyll in it for a start. So now you'll get into the point where you can say to yourself, wow, I'm getting up to now maybe about 70% of this are my cannabinoids. Now, we go back to the 10% THC. So of that what's there, still only, you know, 10% that's going to be THC, like you still, you know, so people don't realise just how low the potency gets really. You think, you know, smoking dab, oh my God, yes. You know, you will, you will notice it at a very, very small dose. But, you know, um, putting it into medicines, you still, yeah, you, you know, we're still trying to approach, you know, we're trying to get from that to how many milligrams of THC is there. Are you starting to see the problems? So we can only ever approximate, and generally the way we have to test our medicines is to take them. You know, like most oil makers are their own guinea pigs, and before they give someone a new medicine, they will try it themselves, and they will say, this is what it's done. Um, and therefore we can approximate, you know, what is a dosage. Um, so this will change when we can start to get tested. For example, okay, I'll give you, I managed to get one medicine, two medicines tested. Okay, this will probably, um, is everyone, I know it's a bit confusing, is everyone sort of following? Yes. Okay, so I'll go through these two test results I got and it might actually help a little bit with your understanding. Now, one sample, they both had two different strains in about the same, but one sample had another strain that was a bit of really old seedy head that someone had given me that had been grown around here. And I thought, hmm, it's really old. So that means it would have more of the cannabidiol in it. Hang on, cannabis, no hang on, the cabinol, cannabinol, CBN. <laughs> I get, I do, even I get mixed up with all my cannabinoids. Um, so it's CBN, and that's the one, it's the degradation product of the THC. So you find it in old weed. And it has its own medical properties, it's quite sedative. So it's, it's actually not such a bad thing to have if you specifically want it for sleep or chronic pain. So they would, that was the difference between the two um, concentrates. And I thought, well, that will probably give me a clue as to whether the testing's accurate. 
because I would expect, be expecting sample one would have a higher percentage of CBN than sample two, where the weed was quite fresh. Following me so far? Yes. Right. So, I looked at the results of THC, 30, and they didn't um, distinguish between acid, you know, whether it was decarbed or not decarbed, and it, for our purposes at the moment, that's fine, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so THC was only 30%. And I went, oh my God, like I thought it was heaps more potent than that. So I was all disappointed, thinking, oh, you know, oh, we've done a really good job. And, and then I looked at the rest of the cannabinoids. Well, there we go, CBD was 8%. Now that sounds really low, doesn't it? But in the natural plant, it's only 1% to 2%. So without realising it, we'd actually used a combination of strains that both had a slightly higher CBD content and ended up with a CBD of 8%. And the CBN, you know, the aged one I was talking about, first sample it was 5%, and the second sample it was 1%. And that's 1% is about what you find in the normal. So to me that was an indication that this was an accurate result. Would, would you guys have made sort of the same assumption yes. with that? So then the, um, and then I started to have a look at the other cannabinoids and there was this, you know, because I must admit, you know, I'm pretty busy with this herbal medicine degree so, you know, I haven't researched the separate cannabinoids as much as I'd like. Um, and I saw CBG was there, cannabigerol. I thought, wow, there's like 17% of that. So went to good old Google, had a look at CBG. It's the precursor molecule for THC, CB, CBD, and um, CBV, cannabivarin, which is another one with medical uses as well. Um, and I also had a reasonable percentage of that. I think it was about three or four percent of um, cannabivarin in it as well. Um, so we actually had several different cannabinoids as well. There was one other one. I had a little bit of um, the THCV, oh, yes. that one. I can't remember yet. And a little bit of that one too. But so, then it raises the question, well, what happens to that cannabigerol? Well, I suppose the assumption you can make is that it has its own enzyme system that converts it in the plant, like while it's still growing, so that, you know, you end up with, um, you know, still mainly THC, but the other ones as well. So what happens when you, you know, decarb it? What's going to happen to that cannabigerol? Well, we don't really know, do we? Like, haven't sort of gone into the chemistry of it that much, but I sort of thought, well, it'll probably follow the same ratio of conversion, maybe just accelerated because of the heat, as in the plant. So it, most of it would probably convert to THC. So that means that that would have put the THC content up over 40% in the actual medicine, and that's great. So if you've got some of this 40%, so if I just gave that concentrate, I now know that's 40%. So I can work out by the weight of my extract, and so, so that, say the extract was one gram, so we've worked out that THC is probably going to be about 40% of one gram. What's 40% of 1,000 milligrams? 400. So there you go. 400 milligrams of THC. No wonder, no wonder when I've tested my medicine, sometimes I've been absolutely off my tip for two days. <laughs> which my, which I think my husband's just about divorced me on that one. I like to think of it as post cancer prevention treatment myself. Um, because there is just no other way to really test it at the moment. Okay, so that was all very lengthy and everything, but did that give you a better idea of what we do to our buds? Yes. Any questions about that? Anything you want me to clarify any further? Oh, wow. How do There's got to be one. <laughs> How do you test for these percentages? How do you know? Oh, this, this actually got tested in, um, you know, thin layer chromatography. Yep, yep. Um, there's, there's two main ways that we can um, test any, any substance. 
um, the thin layer chromatography, and there's a fancy one and a, and a not so fancy one. Um, but by far the gold standard, and if the government would only realise if they provided mass spectrometry um, to the public at a reasonable rate, all naturopaths and herbalists could test their medicine, we wouldn't need the fucking TGA. We wouldn't need fucking layers and layers of administration. All we need is a mass spectrometer and a certificate of analysis. And that gets rid of how many bureaucrats? You know, we do not need the TGA to regulate herbal medicine. They cannot do it. They are a pharmaceutic model. We are a whole plant model. It cannot and never will work. But we're dealing with a government that believes everything that Big Doc tells them. So this is, I believe, the fight. And as I say when I say cannabis is a gateway, this is the other thing we have to do, is to get herbal medicine out of the hands of the TGA before we lose more and more of our precious herbal phytoconstituents. Because what's happening, the research is coming out on our phytoconstituents and they're fucking banning the phytoconstituent. You know, Damiana, that's on the list to go? Because they, I can't remember the, the chemical that they've isolated out of it that they've done studies on. So, oh, no, no, now that's going to be considered to, to be scheduled. Yeah, the isolate, which means that then the herbalist can't use Damiana because it contains that isolate. I know, this is what we're up against. Excuse me, I get really cranky about this. We've lost so many good herbs. You know, to the TGA's interference, ephedra, yeah, okay, you can make speed out of it. But it's also an excellent asthma herb. Yes. It does other things, it's, it's essential. The, the, the uh, Chinese practitioners have got ephedra, they can use it, but the herbalists can't. So we've got the crazy situation like with foxglove, you can grow those flowers in your garden, that's not illegal, and foxglove contains a, a cardiac drug called digitalis which is, was made into digoxin, isolated, and that's the drug, well, it's not so commonly used now, but for, a, you know, for atrial fibrillation, most of you have heard of that or someone with it, the irregular heartbeat. Okay, so foxglove extract is scheduled S4. So that means that a doctor can prescribe you foxglove extract, a doctor who knows absolutely nothing about it, but a herbalist that studied it for three or four years can't. This is the laws we have governing herbal medicine. So now when you know when I say cannabis is a gateway drug, this is the gateway. You know, we need to get back that human right to choose what we want to put into our bodies and not have a government force us to use something more dangerous before we can use something that's less dangerous. And this is where the general public has to stop being apathetic because we've got to win it back. You know, it's crazy. I mean, when the private health insurance is taking herbal, you know, all natural therapies off there, I mean, what a backward step. Wow, anyway, enough, raving on. How long have I got to go, guys? <laughs> looks, looks like you're stuck with me for a bit longer. <laughs> Okay, so now did I finish saying it? Oh, okay, I'll finish telling you about the trivia quiz. I'll come back to that for a minute. Okay, so, um, so then the first day of the weekend will be the audience participation and the little semi-final to decide the finalists. And then the next day will be the final panel with our little extra section at the end for challenges. Now, the reason I'm doing this, I'm doing this for several reasons. First of all, because it's fun. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a, an, an, a nice, easy, more memorable way of getting information into you. Secondly, I'm getting a bit tired of people spouting their absolutes. That this is the only way you can do something anyway, rah, rah, rah. So, I want to provide a platform for healthy debate. So, and that's why I brought in the challenges that require research. Um, I'm not talking about double-blind randomised controlled trials because we know that doesn't work for whole plant medicine. But there's so much research out there that's legitimate. And, um, and so if people have a claim and they think that's it, that's the only way, or blah, 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 well, that's fine, but just prove it to us. Um, and if you can't prove it, then don't make it an absolute. Does that sound reasonable? 
<laughs> See, I've got a fan here. <laughs> she's, she's been my go-to the whole talk. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then, um, so we've decided once we get it, like, really established and people are starting to think about the trivia quiz when they come to the Medicam workshop as well as learning things, um, for the Mardi Gras in 2020, we're going to have a huge big grand final with really good prizes. Yeah, um, so we've got a year and a half to figure out our really good prizes and to and to get enough um, finalists, you know, to have enough competition so we've got a, a reasonable number of finalists, you know. Because, I mean, we've all learned so much over the last five years. Our, everybody's learning curve has just been like this. And I think it's good just to give people a chance to show off a bit to show their knowledge that they've learned and, um, and educate in the process, have a good time. And, um, you know, so it, it won't replace, I mean, I might not even run it every time, like, you know, um, cause you know, Michael reckons I'm just being lazy and getting you guys to do all the work. Um, you know, so I, my job is still to educate you. Um, so I can't let you do all the work. Um, yes, yeah, so that is now the plan for the trivia quiz. So if anyone asks you about it, that's what's happening. Um, and I reckon, yeah. So I'll say, I might just feel some questions until they say I'm finished. Until someone comes to rescue me. Because I think that talk um, about the extractions is probably enough for the heavy shit for the day. Um, would you agree? So, yes. He's still on about the alcohol. <laughs> okay, Everclear, sorry, what was the question? Uh, I don't really know because, as I said, I have a still and I make my own. Um, but apparently people do seem to be able to get it online. I think if you get it from overseas, there may, you know, I don't know if it gets stopped in customs because it's, I think it might be classified as a dangerous substance because it's alcohol. So it would be a bit, bit hard to get from overseas. But I think you can get it in Australia. Um, you know, a few people do use Everclear, um, and I don't, there's no problem with that. It's a grain alcohol. It's as a matter of fact, the purists like Everclear because it's a grain alcohol. But um, you know, truly for our purposes, I don't think it really matters that much. Um, but yeah, so it's just you know, um, you can always ask around. You know, like Pete, there may be people, you know, ask the oil makers, you know, you might get some that they may not, they may have moved on to another extraction method, but they may still know where to get the Everclear from. Um, you know, because a lot of these guys have moved on to using rosin presses and, and things like that, um, because it is such a pure product that you get. Um, but you need the money to set up a rosin press. So most of us are stuck with, you know, the slightly cheaper forms of extraction. And um, any more questions, anyone? I don't believe it. Nothing that you want me to talk about that. No, nothing you can think of. Paul, think of a question. <laughs> My husband's sitting there. Um, well, I do both. I do cold ethanol um, and I do butane, but mainly because butane is so quick and you get such a pure product. So risk benefit, it's quite cheap, you know, because you're looking at Venti is, um, and you can get, a, now I've just found out, you can get that sort of grade, not quite hospital grade, but still pure enough to use 99.9% .9 pure or whatever. Um, and you can get that online, you know, if you look at, I mean, eBay and, you know, things like that. Um, but the Venti is a little over $5 a can and you usually do three or four cans for a run. So that's pretty cheap, really. Um, and just your electricity to decarb, you know, in the oven, you know, that sort of thing. Um, sorry? Sorry? How do you cook? How do I cook? Cook? Oh, 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 okay, safety, safety issues with butane and alcohol, yes. That's probably not a bad little thing to end off with. Okay, so, yes, anything that's flammable, obviously, you don't use direct heat. You know, so you don't think, shit, I'm glad I've, I've got that bit finished and light up a fag. Not a good idea. Okay, so to be, I use for ethanol, I use um, a hot water bath. And, and so I sit it and I just keep changing the water so it's really hot. It gets the ethanol up to about 50%, which is 50, yeah, two, which is enough to evaporate it off. 
um, and that's a really safe way of doing it. Butane, I just use a fan. Sit it in front of a fan, make sure that the room's well ventilated. Remember it's heavier than air, so it will drop. So you get a mental picture in your mind of what's happening to the butane, where it's blowing off. So you make sure you don't do this evaporation anywhere in, in an enclosed space where there may be some sort of naked flame. Um, and so it's really just common sense. You know, really, if you think about it. Um, so, so they are the safety issues with that. But I find that, honestly, it's worth it a little bit of extra time to do it safely rather than to do low heats in ovens and stuff like that. Again, I'm not talking in absolutes. It's horses for courses. But to me, that's the safest way to do it, is to not, have, not involve any source of heat at all. Just use um, heat in the case of the ethanol with hot water and just simple evaporation for butane. And then the rest of it gets purged in the, um, you heat it up because it's easier to work with and you can get rid of the remnants of the butane there. And the last bits will tend to go after decarbing in the oven. So generally speaking, there would only be micro bubbles of butane left and certainly for ingestion it would not be a problem. You know, the body can cope with that tiny amount of butane anyway. So, you know, I've tried to look at it from both the chemical, safety, cost, all of that point of view. And my conclusion, if you don't have the fancy ways to extract, then the most cost effective and relatively safe way to do it is butane. And there'll be purists that will disagree with that, and that's fine too. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable with any sort of chemical, then you're stuck with oil. <laughs> Um, but if, um, you know, if you think alcohol is the only thing you're going to use, then use that. So, there you go. I went to finish up before Michael. No fucking bugger here at all. I just had to keep talking. I had a, I had a lot of trouble thinking of things to say. Sorry about, sorry about, sorry about the punishment. So we're going to have a break now. And, but there's a few things I need to tell you about the break. So Radical is under the tree at the, just, just on the end there, and he's going to do an extraction demonstration with ethanol. You didn't and good boy. Good boy, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for your attention, and um, come back for the trivia quiz. Yeah. And is it October 2021, I think? I said the big grand finals 2020. <laughs> Unbelievable. I have to stay alive. <laughs> Anyway, so we're going to have a break now, but under the tree over there, Radic is going to do an extraction demonstrations. He, he's, he's, his father was a herbalist. He's grow up, grown up in a household doing that. You can ask him anything you like. So there's, there's a big advantage to not too many people being here today. You can get lots of personal questions in. And Rayman's there doing juicing of raw cannabis, which saved her life. And Gerald has got, they've got the big machine that squeezes out hemp seed oil. I'm not sure if they've got the thing. They couldn't work it yesterday. They knew it's an American machine. You need the right PowerPoint. But I think it's working today. So those three demonstrations you won't find anywhere else are on there. So believe it or not, you are pioneers being here today. Yay. And we'll come back. You know, at about it's, it's now 12, 10 past 1. We'll come back at 2 o'clock for Malcolm Lee. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Sit this on the bench.